It's Friday afternoon. We've locked the door because that sushi I just ate is not sitting well and no one should be subjected to that. And also because it's time for another edition of our weekly podcast, Tales from the Brown Desk. I'm Jake Rigney of Rigney Law, LLC. With me as usual is my law partner, wife, and my next ex-wife, Cassie Rigney. Terry Ulm is our host, topic selector, floor demand monitor, and email screener. Terry, did we get enough emails to spur us to buy the floor demand board game? We're one shy, and I thought about emailing myself, but I don't know <laughs> if that would count. So We only got one email. No, we're one shy. Oh, we, so needed we needed three. three. We got two. We got two. Wow. So I thought about emailing myself, <laughs> but... All right, here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to extend it for one week. Okay, so we still need, but I'm going to push the limit up to two. Two. We need two more emails, okay. not just one. Uh, and they have to be from different people than the first two <laughs> came from. Because uh, my mom and your mom don't count twice. <laughs> I mean, they count once, they don't count twice. Friendly reminder, Tales from the Brown Desk is a free-flowing conversation involving two foul-mouthed attorneys. It may include graphic descriptions of sexual activity, violence, and fast and furious car fights. It may not be suitable for children. Paul Walker, Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez, Tay Diggs, Wonder Woman, or the guy that played Han. I read recently that Han isn't actually dead in the Fast and Furious franchise. Did you guys hear this? They are bringing him back to life. That's that's Han from Fast and Furious, not Han from Star Wars. <laughs> that guy is still totally dead. <laughs> Listener discretion is advised. Here's Terry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jake. How are you today? I'm okay, Terry, or I'll, I'll be okay. Let's put it that way. Okay. Hi, Cassie. How are you? Hi, Terry. I'm fine. Thank you. Good. So last week we talked about IMPD's new oversight board, uh -huh. the trial penalty and the Sixth Amendment right to trial, and then we answered some commonly asked criminal law questions. Okay. Now this week we're going to talk about theft, burglary, and robbery. Oh, yeah. That's good. I'm glad we're going to talk about it because these, these are phrases that people use interchangeably and they are not interchangeable. Yeah, I think I may use them interchangeably. Um, we're also going to talk about a pharmaceutical company that recently pled guilty to criminal charges. Right. Yeah, the company took an oath to tell the truth and said it committed some crimes. Very interesting. Yeah, I think so. So we're going to jump right into our discussion on burglary, robbery, and theft. Our, okay. These words are not used interchangeably. They mean different things. They do mean different things. They signify completely different crimes which with different elements, um, and they mean that a different thing happened to you. So you cannot just say, I've been robbed, and it mean anything you want it to mean. It, it has to... That means a very specific thing happened to you, and people often use it incorrectly. So I assume these three different types of crimes um, have different levels. Like, what's the lowest level one of burglary, robbery, or theft? I would say to back up, we're all talking about taking of property. The question is, how was that property taken? Theft is shoplifting is a classic example of burglary. You're going into a building to do it. Robbery, you're taking it from a person by some level of force. The highest level you can get on a theft, I believe, is a five. And that's because if it's over $50,000, you get to a level five. So theft is the, the most simple $750 or less. You're a misdemeanor, $750 to $50,000. You're a level six felony. Above $50,000, you're a level five felony. There's no deadly weapon. There's no body bodily injury. Uh, it's strictly based. It's, it's a financial evaluation there. When you're talking about burglary and robbery, you start with the lowest, the lowest level is level five with your basic on both of those. Um, and you know, you break into a non dwelling, a non residence, not someone's home without a deadly weapon. No one gets hurt. You'll get a level five. Same as the robbery. You can take something by force, but you didn't use a deadly weapon and you didn't hurt anybody. You mentioned, I, I may have these numbers wrong, but theft, like $750 to $50,000, that's such like a, a wide range. It is, um, although the irony is is that the current version of theft um, came into effect in the 2014 code change, but before that, the range was even wider. Hmm. Um, before that, you could get charged with a level six felony for any dollar amount. 
and it went all the way up to 100,000. So the range has actually gotten smaller for what is a level six felony. But back in the day, if you stole a packet of Kool-Aid for 25 cents, you could get charged with a felony. Wow. Where did these ranges come from? Like this $750 theft? If if Chad goes out and steals something worth mm-hmm. $750, he could be facing the same type of sentence as if he sold something worth $50,000? Well, forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those numbers come basically from them seeing the problem. I think the legislature saw the problems that they were having with the old level six felony or the old D felony, where it was anything from zero to a hundred thousand dollars. So they wanted to shorten that range a little bit. People were getting charged with felonies for, you know less than $10, less than $5 worth of stuff that they were stealing. And there was some righteous pushback about that. So that's where 750 came from. They said, okay, fine. We're going to make sure that it's only a misdemeanor if it's less than $750. Um, In terms of why the upper level number came down, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, Actually, you know, I, I still don't know. If anything, it should have gone up because money is worth less than it was when they originally passed that law, right? When they passed that law, $100,000 was probably worth 250000 now. Um, but for some reason, they, they brought it down. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why they did that. So can you give us an example of a theft incident? Chad goes to Walmart. He's hungry and wants to grill out. He goes to the freezer section and selects a steak. (laughs) He places the steak in his pants and then exits the store. Without paying. Yes. Exits the store without paying. (laughs) Okay. Um, If Chad went into my kitchen and did that, is that theft? That depends on how he got into your kitchen. (laughs) Uh, if you invited Chad in mm-hmm. or you left your door propped open so that Chad did not have to use any force to enter your kitchen, um, then it that is also theft. But if your door was closed and Chad had to use any force at all to push it open, or in fact, even if your door was open but not open enough for somebody to walk all the way through and so chad had to use a little bit of force to push the door open a little bit further so he could come in then it's burglary okay because he's broken into your house your which is a structure can you give me not this one we're talking about but give me and the listeners an example of a burglary Sure. Uh, So Chad um, is addicted to cigarettes and really enjoys them. So he waits till after the uh, ye olde tobacco shop closes. And then he um, climbs up onto the roof with a ladder, cuts a hole in the roof, comes down through the roof into the insulation, (laughs) um, comes down through the paneled ceiling, uh, loads up a backpack full of smokes, um, thinks, yay, I never have to buy cigarettes again. And uh, then repels with a bungee cord straight out of the uh, <laughs> the tobacco shop back out onto the roof where he, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, and Don Cheadle make <laughs> off with their uh, 11 cartons of smokes. And now, an example of a robbery. Uh, during store hours, Chad enters the cigarette shop <laughs> <laughs> and goes up to the cash register and threatens the cashier that he's going to kill him if he doesn't give him. His eleven, all all the cartons of cigarettes, or eleven cartons of cigarettes, and he packs them up and leaves. Now, in your experience, are these crimes typically stacked with other types of charges like home invasion or trespass? Some of them are. Some of them are not. Theft is not usually stacked with anything else, unless like, unless the person who's accused of committing the theft is also accused of like fighting the people that we're trying to stop them from leaving. Like if, if the Chad with the meat in his pants scenario at the supermarket and the supermarket tries to stop him, they're like, Hey, take that meat out of your pants, Chad. And and he's like, not today, but call me later. Uh, (laughs) um, And, and there's a physical altercation that he could get charged with other things based on that. But, um, but theft is not usually the kind of thing where they find a different 
thing to also charge you with. Robbery is hit or miss. Sometimes they'll stack a theft charge, but if they do, it's usually because the robbery is a little bit weak. And most of the time, they just don't. But with burglary, they almost always do put a theft charge in there, unless unless the burglary didn't involve a theft. Because when you hear burglary, you think theft. Right. But um, that's not actually what the burglary statute says. You can burglarize something or someone and not take something? Yes. Um, the burglary statute says that it is a crime to break and enter the structure of another person uh, with the intent to commit theft or a felony therein. So you commit the crime as soon as you break and enter, right? Not when you actually take something. You don't have to actually steal anything. You just have to intend to steal things when you break and enter. What if Chad's intentions of breaking in a dwelling is to rape somebody in there. Is that burglary? Yes, because wow. he intends to commit a felony inside. It's the same if you break into a house in order to shoot someone or um, you break into a house in order to rob them. And this is where, you know, you ask that question. They, he would be charged with both burglary and rape, you know, if he, he got there. But that's, you know, that's one of those things that it's a defense attorney. I don't like when people say stacking charges. In that case, he should be charged with burglary and rape. And is that stacking? Well, I mean, it's just charging him with what the facts allege, um, you know. So I think that, that your reaction there, you know, hits to that. You know, we're talking before about, you know, stacking charges, you know, this bad thing that prosecutors do. Well, it's not always that way. Interesting. Now, can you give us some examples that a criminal defense attorney may use in these types of charges, burglary, robbery, or theft? Like, what are defenses a person could have? Well, it's difficult to categorize defenses in the first place, right? Because every case is a little bit different. And I have no idea what's going to come across my desk tomorrow. And I don't really talk about the ones on my desk right now. Um, I, one example of a defense, I, I tried a robbery case a long time ago when I was a prosecutor. Um, and the defense in that case was essentially that it was a misunderstanding, right? That um, Because the robbery statute says uh, you take property by force or threat of force. Right. So it's if you beat a, beat somebody up and take a pack of smokes from them, that's easy. That's force. Right. But you can say things to people that make them feel like they need to give you their smokes that might not. That might be ambiguous. You know what I mean? So right. the, the defense in that case was essentially I, w I didn't try to place her in fear. I wasn't trying to scare her or take this property by threat of force. I was just panhandling. And and she got scared, and so I left. Coincidentally, I won that trial. Uh, the judge decided that was robbery, but but that was the defense in that one. Every criminal case is different, and you're always looking at every element of the offense and trying to figure out whether the state can prove all those elements or not. So literally, your defense in every case can be any element of it, including who did it. Now, can robbery, burglary, and theft... Can these charges be expunged? Uh, theft can fairly easily. Um, robbery and burglary, not so much. Um, they both can still be expunged, but those are discretionary, left up to the judge. Um, and even if they are expunged, they'll still show up in background searches. There will just be a notation at the bottom of the case chronology that says, oh yeah, and this was expunged. But with theft, since that's usually just a misdemeanor or a level six felony, or back in the old days it was a D felony, those can be expunged by right, and when they are, they are um, not made for available for public consumption anymore. And so they're, they kind of do disappear. Um, now it's not perfect, and sometimes they'll still show up somewhere, but they're not supposed to. So now we're going to go and move on to a new story that's that's making headlines right now. And the Indiana Gazette reports that drug maker Purdue Pharma 
the company behind the powerful prescription painkiller OxyContin that experts say touched off an opioid epidemic, will plead guilty to federal criminal charges as part of a settlement of more than $8 billion. Yeah, billion with a B. Billion. It's reported that the plea deal does not release any of the company's executives or owners and members of the wealthy Stackler family from criminal liability and criminal and a criminal investigation is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Note that the Stackler family was once listed as one of the nation's wealthiest families in Forbes magazine. Mm -hmm. Family members say that they acted ethically and lawfully. <laughs> But but some state attorney generals say that the agreement fails to hold the Stacklers accountable. Connecticut Attorney General William Tong said the federal government had the power to put this family in jail, and they didn't. Instead, they took fines and penalties that Purdue will likely never fully pay. As part of the plea deal, the company admits that it violated federal law and that it knowingly and intentionally conspired and agreed with others to aid and abet the dispensing of medication without a legitimate medical purpose and outside the usual course of professional practice to boost its manufacturing quotas. Right. Yeah, the company will plead guilty to three counts, including conspiracy to defraud the United States and violating a federal anti-kickback laws. Now, if this crime was committed by a person, what type of penalties would they be facing? Like, why is nobody <laughs> going to jail here? Well, so let's start with a couple of facts before we get into all the opinions we have, okay? Uh, first fact is people may still go to jail. Uh, I think I read that the investigation is still ongoing and that, that, that criminal liability has not been, uh, they have not been absolved of criminal liability. So they were not given immunity for any of this. But it is extraordinarily striking to me that a person can get caught um, with divide, dividing up 11 grams worth of cocaine on the street and look at 10 to 30 years in prison for it. Um, meanwhile, this family sold billions of dollars worth of drugs and greased doctors' palms to get them to do it, to get them to prescribe it by giving them ridiculous fees to speak at events um, in return for convincing them to issue more prescriptions that got thousands of people addicted to this drug and caused tens of thousands of overdoses. And they're like, well, we, we gave the money back. And that's good enough. Yeah, not for me. It's it's stunning. It really is. Um, I also, it's weird that their name is Purdue Pharmaceuticals. I do not believe they're related to the school. And I can't figure out how there was never like some kind of like trademark lawsuit about this. Right. Like, seriously, I'm not allowed to call myself the Harvard law firm. <laughs> like, I mean, we should, maybe we should do that. Should we just change it to, yeah. And yeah, we work for the Harvard law firm. I suspect it all comes back that there's more than one Purdue and they're allowed to do their own Purdue thing under their name. Like so we couldn't stop someone else from opening Rigney Law, another, well, oh, Rigney. Not if their names were Rigney. Right. Right. But uh, the Sackler family, their name's not Purdue. Their name is Sackler. Are they the original founders of Purdue? Yeah, I did though? a little research, and, like, the, the, the one in the family that started the business, his mm. middle name was Purdue. Oh, that's weak. That's yeah. weak as hell. Mitch Daniels ought to sue somebody over that. Yes. And then can you also explain to me and the listeners, like, how in the world is a company charged with a crime? Like, how can a company plead guilty? Like, who who is standing there pleading it? Does the company have to waive its right to trial? Like, who speaks for the company? So. <laughs> How's the company talk? Right. Well, the CEO talks for the company, uh, or the, the company's lawyers talk for the company, just like we do for folks in criminal court. But because a corporation technically has personhood in the United States, uh, they can be charged with crimes. Uh, obviously, 
since they do not have a physical human form, there is no one that can be put in prison for the crimes of the corporation. Uh, those person's individual crimes can cause them to go to prison, and that might still happen in, in this case, but we don't know. Um, but the corporation has also been charged with a crime and has been punished in this agreement where it pleads guilty and agrees to pay restitution. So you said a word there, restitution. Is that what this should be called instead of a settlement? Like I've always viewed settlements as, as one way that civil lawsuits are resolved. And I didn't know settlements were part of criminal cases. Right. Settlement is not a term of art. It does not mean a specific thing beyond the parties agreed to resolve a thing. So technically any plea agreement can be called a settlement. Settlements, on the other hand, can't be called plea agreements because no one's pleading to anything. And restitution or judgment, I mean, those are all just judgments to pay money to a particular person. I mean, in this case, I think the judgment is to the U.S. government, but it's weird because it doesn't seem like it makes sense to file a criminal case against an entity that isn't a person that can't go to jail. Right. But there are some benefits to it. The main benefit is that you can negotiate these types of large payments in restitution from a corporation that you would never have been able to have gotten from its individual employees. So even the CEO doesn't have $8 billion to give you in in an agreement, but um, but the company does. Well, and part of the settlement is that they're giving over control. There are some outside forces coming in and going to start, I don't know if it's part of their ongoing investigation or just getting them back on the right track, but there was, it was more than just paying restitution. Right. But potentially the, the country's biggest drug dealers, the Sacklers, uh, were removed from their board and no longer are allowed to run their company. They still own it, and yeah. they still get to collect all the uh, the stock dividends or or whatever it is that they 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 still get the profits from it. But it, it'll be run by a trust now and a board. That's crazy. These drug dealers, they still own this company. They're not on the board. They're not running right. it anymore. But they're still profiting from it. Right. It's like if we charged Pablo Escobar, except instead of charging him, we charged his cartel, told him he could just take the money he already made and go chill out. He just had to give us a little bit of it back. And we'd keep giving him the profits we were making from selling his cocaine here going forward. Well, this is, I mean, this is life for the one percenters. I mean, it's all, you know, they're making these deals. They're, you know, pharmaceutical companies are in with the politicians and um, I'll give a plug to a, a book I read, American Pain, by John Temple. Even as a eight-plus-year deputy pro drug prosecutor, I, it was very educational. Um, it talks about how this pandemic uh, or epidemic of, of the opiates uh, started, and it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. And it's all money, and it's historically uh, there have been spikes and other substances in the past that the government would, uh, if you didn't know, the government decides manufacturing limits for these kind of drugs. And you've probably heard of what, well, when they had meth, they didn't call it that, but with quaaludes in the seventies and, you know, the diet pills, those things that, but back then our elected officials had some kind of moral compass. And when a uh, conversion of those drugs was getting out of hand, they'd put, they'd keep the limits. But if you look back on the opiates, the, the manufacturing limits, despite the problems keep going up 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 and you know that's because those politicians are getting paid uh and they're they're beholden to the dollar not to the voters yeah campaign donations yep so now we are going to cut to a short commercial break and when we come back we will bring you the latest florida man news today's update on florida man is brought to you by the first amendment you know, that amendment designed to make sure we can speak against our government and go to church without the government being involved. That one. Turns out, what it really meant was corporations can engage in unlimited political bribery and there's nothing you can do about it. Who knew? I knew. I know it's really important amendment too, because it's the first one. Things that are important come first. That's why I feed my dog before I feed my kids. What a country. You keep talking bad about America, I'll have to introduce you to the Second Amendment, too. So, it's funny, Jake, you mentioned Kool-Aid earlier in this episode. Did you, like, read my notes? 
No, not at all. I, I had a case uh, when I was a very young prosecutor where I prosecuted somebody for stealing uh, six packs of Kool-Aid valued at like 15 cents a piece. Wow. I sent someone to prison for three years for stealing a candy bar. Wow. In my defense, it was literally <laughs> like the 15th felony conviction he had. Um, and I threatened him with the habitual. So he actually pled guilty and, and took that one. But I was a hard ass. Yeah, I'd say. That's he, an expensive candy bar. I, bet I hope if, it was good. I bet if he would have pled open, he wouldn't have gotten that from the judge. Um, I like pleading open. but So News Channel 8 reports. Florida man is accused of using a 24-cent packet of Kool-Aid to mm -hmm. rack up nearly $1,000 in fraudulent charges at Walmart. Uh, how? Well, police were called to the store on reports of a theft in progress. Uh -huh. The store loss prevention officer watched Florida man scan merchandise with a Kool-Aid packet concealed in his hand oh, so that each the item... <laughs> I've yeah. seen this. I've seen this scam before. Yeah. It's good though. Tell them how it works. Yeah. So each item that he rung up rang up as twenty four cents each. Right. The worker told police she recognized Florida man from a prior incident at the store. <laughs> yes. I, I love when they go back to the scene of the crime to commit another crime. This will surely work. Right. Uh, she told police that in the prior incident, Florida man took a can of soda and a fan from off a shelf and then returned them to the customer service receiving $9.48. <laughs> Without ever having bought them in the first right. place. Yeah. He was also previously accused of walking out of the store with a shopping cart of unpaid items, including a scooter valued at $248, a dual navigation system valued at $119 and $160 worth of batteries. That's a lot of batteries. What? $160? <laughs> it's like can a you cart make, full of batteries. Can you make meth out of batteries? I think you can, right? I think part of the inside can be used, but you got to like take it apart and like scrape the inside out right, or the something. Right, the lithium out of it or something. something. So he had a scooter, dual navigation system, and $160 worth of batteries. It's an interesting... He was trying to make a, he was trying to make a rocket ship <laughs> so he could fly to Louisiana and play heavy metal music at the the hurricane. I wonder if people just forget where they commit all their crimes and that's why they go back. They might they might. Now deputies arrested him at the store um and he faces grand theft and shoplifting charges. Mm -hmm. Now are grand theft charges a thing in Indiana? I no, there is no crime that's called grand theft. Although I, as we previously noted, there are these different levels of theft, right? There's uh, there's the misdemeanor, the level six felony, and the level five felony. If you wanted, you could call the level five felony grand theft, um, and it would sound cooler. But um, not very many people get charged with that crime in the first place. So, um. Although I doubt, obviously, he had $75,000 worth of stuff. Whatever he had, it, it apparently met Florida's upper limit and got him charged with grand theft. It sounds a lot a lot more serious, doesn't it? Yeah, it does with the grand in there. Yeah. Yeah. He's no thief. He's a grand thief. He is. Now, Florida professionals are losing their minds. NBC2 reports the Florida deputy gave kids... Guns to fight demons, he said, were in their home. <laughs> yeah. The now okay. former now former Orange County deputy is accused of giving a gun to a child and telling her to shoot anyone who entered his apartment. He also allegedly performed an exorcism on a second child. According to local NBC affiliate WESH, Florida man was arrested after deputies were called to an apartment. Deputies said they found Florida man with a gun at the apartment and saw a young Florida girl lying on the floor with a rifle. Florida girl was wearing a Kevlar helmet and a bulletproof vest, and she was ready to shoot anyone who entered the apartment. Florida girl told deputies that when she woke up, Florida man told her there were demons in the house and they needed to burn things that were possessed. Florida girl said they burned several items in the parking lot and performed an exorcism on her brother. Florida man was taken to a hospital for a mental health evaluation under the Baker Act. And Florida man was arrested after being released from the hospital. He's facing child abuse charges. Yeah, that, that sounds appropriate. If, um, 
Yeah, if Indiana man did, what Florida man did, would that be the charge he's, the yeah. crime he's charged with? Well, in Indiana, they don't call that child abuse. They call it child neglect, right? It's a neglect of a dependent is what it's called. Now, Heavy reports that Florida man attorney is accused <laughs> of being a serial bank robber after six robbery attempts. Two were successful. Yeah, Florida man attorney. Uh huh. Yep. So here's the thing about uh, being a lawyer, right? And you'll note you noticed it with that first shoplifting scam, right? As soon as, as soon as uh, you told me he was palming the Kool Aid, I knew exactly what he was doing. Um, as attorneys, we get exposed to many different types of scams, and sometimes you get it in your head that you could pull one off. And to be honest. I have one brewing in my head right now <laughs> that will totally work. I guarantee you it will work. I'm not going to do it because uh, it's not worth enough money for me to lose my law license and potentially my business over it. But I have a crime that would totally work. I'm not going to tell you what it is because somebody out there will start using it and then <laughs> I'll get in trouble. Jake Rigney said. <laughs> right. I got it off the podcast, the legal podcast. So, but there are, there are so many different ways to scam and so many different schemes you can pull. I'm not, I'm not even joking, Terry. When I was buying that sushi I was talking about earlier today and I was at the U-Scan, I was... You thought about putting it in your pants, didn't you? I didn't think about putting it in my pants, but I thought, like, I buy so much sushi at this place. I should really go get, like, a sticker for an apple and just scan the apple sticker and... <laughs> And, and then just walk out with the sushi. I've got the receipt in my hand. Nobody's going to say anything to me. I'm in a suit and tie. Yeah. I didn't do it. I thought about it. Now, prosecutors say Florida man attorney was leading a double life as a successful business lawyer on one hand and a bank robber on the other. Federal prosecutors have charged Florida man lawyer with committing a series of bank, of bank robberies and attempted bank robberies in South Florida over the last three weeks. The criminal complaint charges Florida man attorney with robbing $1,050 from one bank and $800 from another bank. It also charges him with attempting to rob four banks around the same time. According to the allegations in the complaint, Florida man attorney followed a consistent approach during his six robbery attempts. Mm -hmm. Again, two were successful. Well, right. not very successful. $1,000. Yeah. Yeah. Florida man lawyer would enter each bank alone, walking up to the teller window, and ask the teller for assistance in making a withdrawal. Florida man attorney would pass a note to the bank teller mm -hmm. that contained handwritten instructions and warnings. Right. The warnings included, don't touch the alarm or call the police. Empty all your 50s and 100s and put them in an envelope. And keep calm and give all the money to me. I have a gun. Florida man attorney would take his note with him on the way out the bank. The FBI issued law enforcement bulletins containing descriptions and bank surveillance images of the robber. And as Florida man was casing out another bank, one of the Florida police recognized him and arrested him. At the time of his arrest, he had a ballpoint hammer tucked in his waistband, and he carried what appeared to be a bank robbery demand notes and instructions on <laughs> how to commit bank robberies. Now, you don't take the tools to the case. See, this is where he messed up. He has not studied bank robberies enough. You do not take your bank robbing tools when you're just going to check out the bank. <laughs> the affidavit, it's too easy. The affidavit also describes items that officers found inside Florida man attorney's backpack, including draft and final versions of two banknotes. Leave it. <laughs> like you <laughs> save your previous drafts? What, do you want to go back and see? <laughs> but leave it to the attorney to like have these drafts and a final version of which one's going to work the best. I don't like this rough draft. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I could see a no that being a note you'd want to take some time, but I mean, do you keep your old drafts? Oh, he did. They and carried them around with him. Yeah, no. Yeah, according to the Miami Herald, Florida man attorney is now represented by a federal public defender. 
Like how does how does that work? Well, uh, you know, when you you call them a successful business attorney, and <laughs> and then he he's he's committing these very uh, risky and high, high penalty crimes for a whopping eighteen hundred dollars. I don't think he was very successful in. I mean, if, if he's going to all this length over eighteen hundred dollars, I suspect he's not sitting on a cache of uh, a crop of cash. Yeah. Because that's a terrible business decision, right? <laughs> right. That is like if if you went to your business lawyer and and your business lawyer was like, "Well, yeah, your profits are down a little bit. Have you tried robbing banks? <laughs> <laughs> it's working for me." You'd be like, "Whoa!" And this is something that I'd heard quite some time ago that robbing banks, while it used to be the go-to theft, that I mean that that they're not. Even when you're walking out with cash, you're not walking out with tens of thousands of dollars. That's oftentimes less than ten thousand dollars, and it's a federal crime. Yeah, well, you don't have time. Um, I've prosecuted several bank robberies over the years. Back when I was a prosecutor, um, y- you have two choices: you can either go in and get a little bit of money and get out quick, or you can go in and go for the big money in the back, but you're going to be there for a long time. And by the time you get that, you're barricaded inside. Then what are you going to do? Like, I mean, then you're in a hostage situation. And that's not what most people who are up for money are trying to do. They're trying to get a little bit of money and get out. So, and it it still doesn't work very well. They usually put a dye pack in there. Then the dye pack explodes. All your money has ink on it, possibly also the inside of your car. (laughs) It's dreadful. Another thing people don't think about how heavy, like you, you, if you get too much, you can't walk away with it. Like the actual physical weight and girth of, of a substantial amount of cash. Now, do you know if in federal court you have to be found indigent to be given a public defender? I don't know about that. I, I couldn't tell you how he got a public defender, although that would jibe with Cassie's theory that he is not a very good business lawyer and that he hasn't been doing so well. Right. I did a little research and I was trying to find out where this attorney worked and the place it said he worked. I went to their website and he's not listed on there anymore. I I, I take him off there, too. Um, But then I saw in some other article where a spokesperson from that law firm said that two years ago he disappeared. He's like never showed up for work again. And you think you might have a drug problem? Probably. I mean, he's not thinking very clearly if you think you're going to rob a bank again and again and again i don't know yeah i don't either well that's all the time we have for the day all right thanks terry and thank you dear listener for listening to tales from the brown desk please remember while we may discuss legal oh you hear that cassie it's our song they're playing our song police sirens Please remember, while we may discuss legal issues and provide information regarding the law to our listeners, we do not intend to create an attorney-client relationship with any listener. Our advice may not be applicable to some legal issues. To be honest, our legal advice may not be applicable with our own real opinions. Sometimes we're just trying to be funny. Please consult with an attorney you've hired to review your legal situation before you attempt to apply the things we've said to your case. They are really playing a lot of our song out there. Lots of sirens. Tales from the Brown Desk is produced by Rigney Law and edited by Terry Ulm. If you want to ask a listener question, email Terry at T-E-R-I at RigneyLawIndy.com and entitle your email podcast question. We'll read it on our next podcast. Give us new content for free or this thing is going under. We are cratering. Buzzsprout says this podcast will get 19 downloads. We're under 20 now. What's going on? I don't know. The farthest away new listener is... Indianapolis, Indiana, we've only got, our last podcast got five downloads. Not even Fishers? Well, Fishers isn't new anymore. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. I I think we still have Fishers and Paris, France, (laughs) because why not? And then three from Indianapolis. That's all that happened in our last one. Now, I've stopped promoting our podcast on my Facebook page because I deleted it from my phone and it's a pain in the butt to get it on there to promote it that might be part of the problem i don't know it's all your fault jake it might just be that the the funny commercials we do aren't that funny and nobody likes it anymore i don't know
I doubt it. I'm not worried about it. The attorneys at Rigney Law do not comment on their current pending cases. Nothing we've said in this podcast is a comment on a case we're currently working on, even if your name is Chad, or if you think that free speech means you can tell a judge to dismiss your case because you're not really an American because you created your own rolling country called Chadatonia, where smoking weed while driving is not illegal, but mandatory. (laughs) See you next week.